So uh, again, welcome uh, to tonight's event. Uh, this is a meetup group on Opportunity Zones and uh, our intent is to share knowledge uh, to help everybody become more aware and uh, just shut the screen on that, Steve. Um, and uh, help everybody learn you know, about them and figure out if this is something they want to do. If you want to do it, then we're going to try to figure out where all the tools and knowledge are available to help you uh, make an opportunity zone investment or create a fund or work something along the path. So um, uh, this is uh, the purpose of our group. Uh, we'll be meeting approximately every two weeks. And uh, initially, we were looking at doing updates on alternative weeks and deep dives on other weeks. But uh, as we progress, we're probably just going to end up doing a series of deep dives every time we get together on a different type of project that addresses a different type of challenge in a community. Uh, this week, we're working on housing. Uh, next week, we're going to have a meeting on the 27th. And there, we're going to be talking about community collaborations about how to get your community organized or how to benefit from the organization of your community to help individual businesses and uh, properties uh, raise funding under this program. Uh, along the path, uh, we're going to be doing case studies. So uh, we completed the Bridge to Opportunity Conference on Friday. Our next goal is to identify up to 12 different types of community challenges, which can be opportunity zone projects. We intend to do a case study, which will be a little bit of a documentary film, uh, a copy of all pertinent documents that were created uh, in raising money between the fund and the uh, designated property or business, and any of the ancillary uh, agreements within the community, and then provide a bit of a guideline or instruction over the top. So this serves as kind of a low-level, low-tier do-it-yourself kit for communities uh, to use everywhere. And then finally, uh, there are still more questions than uh, there are answers uh, as we try to understand the uh, proposed rules of the IRS on opportunity zones and as we each project uh, raises its own questions because the novel uh, issues or questions there. So uh, we're building a uh, basically a library of issues and answers uh, that will be posted on the Invest Local website. And I'll give you the link to that later. And then we're inviting in experts to come in and try to answer the questions as best we can and build uh, this uh, library up over time. So um, that's the general purpose for, for what we're doing while we're here. Uh, my name is Carl Dakin. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I am basically a professional entrepreneur, uh, 40 years in new startups uh, with more startups than I can count and involved in about a dozen ventures uh, concurrently at the present time. And uh, a lot of what I do is help businesses and organizations, social enterprises, and even community projects raise capital. And we look at all forms of money that are available. And Opportunity Zones, when it, it got on my radar earlier this year, looked like it was addressing uh, the last mile, last dollar kind of need for a lot of the communities that I work with. And so uh, we're right now uh, trying to verify, validate that this is true uh, while we're getting a number of projects started. Uh, so uh, I spend part of my time uh, in a cons consultation role uh, working with organizations raising money. I also lead my own projects. And, uh, and then I do a lot of speaking and lecturing at universities and in commercial uh, programs on various topics related to entrepreneurship, growth strategies, and early capital formation. So 40 years of this, uh, I have a, a general idea. This looks like one of the better things I've seen in 40 years. Uh, it was drafted for a specific purpose, but they left it uh, loose enough and general enough that we may actually get something done without too many, no, you can't go there, or too many restrictions, or we'll get around to it later kind of a thing. And it's this uh, lack of, uh, of uh, perfection, so to speak, in making the rules. It's got a lot of people hesitant right now. But we uh, here in Colorado often deal with situations where we have conflicts between federal and state laws, uh, or uh, what's called in the Constitution uh, arguments between state and federal rights. So um, this is no new or different. We're, we're used to playing at the edge where we make up the rules. And a lot of times, we get to keep the rules we made instead of being forced to take somebody else's. So um, tonight, we're going to talk about housing. 
Uh, every community I've talked to about opportunity zones has identified housing as being one of their, their critical issues. Um, each community is different, whether it's rural or urban, uh, whether they're in Colorado or they're another uh, state across the United States. But uh, uh, the Joint Center for Housing Studies is a Harvard group uh, that puts out a study every year looking at housing in the United States. And uh, they basically uh, sum it up as we're approaching a crisis. Uh, that uh, as uh, our economy is starting to come back from the recession, this is driving up housing prices, but the prices of housing are growing faster than associated wages of the people who live in those houses. And, and there's a number of terrible stories out, out there about people who are trapped in communities uh, where they're being gentrified with no ability to do anything about it. Uh, they can't afford to improve the home. There's no money available to them. Uh, they can't justify the market price, all, all these kinds of issues. And so uh, we're, we're seeing this everywhere, that as more people uh, basically get stronger financially, they say, now it's time for me to get a house. And there are not enough houses out there for them. Or what houses are out there are so expensive they can't afford them. And for the longest time, millennials uh, complained that uh, with heavy student loans that they could not afford to buy a house or a car, uh, which was impacting their ability to become part of our, our workforce. So uh, as bad as it is, as bad as it is, um, it's worse for low income people. So um, this particular project we're going to talk about tonight with Brown Equity Partners is primarily aimed at communities of color. Uh, they're starting in Houston and in Birmingham uh, as the first two cities. And their goal is to try to allow uh, people to upgrade their communities without gentrification and do it to people who would ordinarily uh, be considered in the low income or very low income. And as it, it indicates here that uh, we've gone from 6 million to 19 million people uh, who um, qualify for very low income households, but at the same time the amount of housing has gone down uh, while this number has gone up. And um, this means that as bad as the housing crisis is, it is truly a crisis uh, in low-income communities, uh, regardless of color, uh, and that uh, there's a challenge out there. Now, in this case, there's an assumption that somehow government is going to cure this issue. And uh, being a, a free enterprise type of a person, I'm always going to look to uh, private sector to try to solve the problem first. Uh, and, and look to the government for support or to get out of the way where appropriate. Uh, and uh, the, the solution we're proposing tonight is purely a 100% private enterprise type of a solution. So I, I'm pleased to, to talk about it in more detail. So uh, Venetia Dutra, uh, who's shown there on the left, uh, couldn't be here tonight to present her own program because she's headed back to one of the communities where they're looking to pick up uh, some properties to start this. And uh, we're going to uh, talk about this from the fund level and then uh, the uh, property management level and then what we're calling property rejuvenation businesses. Uh, but this is her contact information. She'd be happy to, to talk to you about what she's doing. And, uh, and she's always looking for people who want to participate in any capacity, either as an investor, property buyer, a contractor who can help in rejuvenating a property. Uh, there's lots of different player positions in the game that she's designing. And uh, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to work with her on this particular project. So uh, right now, uh, she's uh, starting to purchase houses in the 3rd, 7th Ward, and in what's called Green, Greens Point in Houston. And she's also starting to pick up properties in Birmingham, Alabama. She's decided that she only wants to handle five cities. She thinks that represents the scope of how big she wants to grow. And she is currently considering uh, other communities across the United States, uh, but a lot of them are in the southeastern United States where the problem appears to be worst. Um, and, um, but uh, there are property zones all across uh, the United States. When each of the states designated their areas, we ended up with about 8,700 total opportunity zones. Uh, most of those are in urban areas, but in Colorado, about 60% are in rural communities. 
And uh, again, from a housing standpoint, it, it doesn't really make a lot of difference. But in terms of available population and markets and people to both implement a project within an opportunity zone or even to reside in the zone, it gets much, much harder in uh, smaller populations in the rural, rural areas. So uh, this is the current org chart for how uh, we've decided to put this together. So we have at the very top is an opportunity zone fund. This is a fund that will conform to the IRS regulations. It is being treated as a pass-through entity. So as soon as it raises money and puts that money into the property management company, its job is done other than to validate that that money is used for the most part within the opportunity zone as required by the rules and also to report semi-annually to the IRS on what it's doing or not doing as far as uh, ongoing activities and this will continue for a 10-year term uh, because it's been decided that this particular project will go for the maximum benefit of opportunity zones by allowing the investments in the fund to sit for 10 years and then to liquidate the fund at that point in time where 100% of the gains in this investment will become tax-free. Um, now it will invest into the property management company. The property management company will be doing all office operations uh, for each of five different property rejuvenation businesses. So the first one uh, will be in the city of, um, now I've got two number twos up there. Um, so uh, the first one will be in the city of Houston, the second will be in the city of Birmingham, and then three more to be identified. They will uh, do the primary activity of build, rejuvenate, and sell properties, but all the staffing, uh, all the back office management, IT, all that stuff will be done by the property management company uh, in order to consolidate those activities and create maximum efficiency in small scale for doing this. So uh, there are, by definition, three tiers of entities that are involved here in order to uh, use this. Now, uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is the individual funding. Uh, as currently conceived, we're looking at raising $600,000 of Opportunity Zone investment into the fund, uh, which is uh, determined to be good enough, big enough to do everything that's necessary to get started and generate revenue. Uh, so uh, it will raise the money and as I said, it will uh, then uh, put that into the property management company. Then in each of the individual property rejuvenation businesses, we are going to do a local crowdfunding. So these are not opportunity zone investments. This is simply a collective uh, equity investment in a local company uh, that uh, will have certain benefits uh, to the different investors and I'll get into that in more detail. Now, uh, the intent is to have enough equity to take down a, a property and to make enough uh, corrections, upgrades to it to allow it to re-enter the market. It's intended to debt leverage all the equity money on a classical 2080 basis. So we're anticipating roughly uh, 3.6 million in total equity funding between private money uh, coming into the property management company, the Opportunity Zone Fund, and then each of the five rejuvenation businesses. This will be uh, leveraged with about 12 million in mortgage financing uh, to uh, allow all these activities to take place. Um, so the uh, part of the uh, reason for this structure is that a lot of times uh, you'll see the problem when money comes into a community from outside, like in a big box store, and that big box store makes profits by selling goods and services in the community, those profits will leave the community at the same time. So it was possible for us to do the entire opportunity fund with opportunity zone investment, but we decided to uh, do a series of local crowdfunding campaigns so that that profit will remain in that particular community and will not find its way uh, departing the community as uh, profits are distributed to the people in the Opportunity Zone Fund. This uh, information, 3.6 million comes from five uh, packages of 600,000 on the properties plus an additional 600,000 
going to the fund itself. Is that correct? That's correct. And then there's also a private equity investment into the property management company that's not shown on this chart uh, that will bring the total to around $3.6 in total, total equity, equity funding. Fund. Then one, one more question. You talked about crowdfunding. Is that where the source of the 600000 is? Each of yeah, in, in each of these cases, we're using what is called investment crowdfunding, uh, which is taking advantage of state uh, or federal law that allows both accredited and non-accredited investors to participate in the investment. So uh, again, we're trying to allow everybody within a community who has a wherewithal and interest to participate in one of these campaigns and not limit it strictly to the wealthy uh, who meet the accredited investor status and not limit it to people who may be completely out of state or out of community uh, in an opportunity zone style investment. Can I ask another question? Sure. On the $12 million in total debt financing, so the way I'm seeing it, let's say the $600,000 goes into the infrastructure, you know, we're going to remodel it, et cetera, et cetera. Let's say a house uh, costs. Uh, well, let me come back to we'll the, the back slide. We're going to get in more detail on that. I understand where you're going. So uh, yeah, so the question is, where does the money go? Uh, let's jump forward to that. We may come back to this if you have more questions. This is the business model that we're using for purposes of cash flow projections for each of the property rejuvenation businesses. So the general assumption is that on average, a property will be picked up for about $168,000 as a purchase price. Uh, 33000 of that will be a down payment that comes out of the investments into each of these rejuvenation businesses. And the first one of these purchases will come out of the Opportunity Zone funding. So if we go back to this slide, the, the first property that's acquired into each of the property rejuvenation businesses is coming out of the first $600,000 and the private equity funding uh, here and then all the subsequent ones will be done with uh, money coming from the investments into the individual rejuvenation businesses. Yes? Give me an example, a couple examples of um, what they're thinking of is for rejuvenation businesses. Uh, it, it basically, they will buy a property, fix it up, and resell it. It's a fix and flip model. So rejuvenation businesses fix and flip? Yep. Yeah, the, the term rejuvenation is used because it's intended to be more community oriented, but it, it's still, at the end of the day, it's a business model of buy, fix it up, and, and resell it. To someone in the community. To someone in the community, and I'll, I'll get into more details on that. Um, uh, so uh, looking back again then at this model, uh, the idea is that a down payment matched with uh, mortgage financing will allow the purchase of the property. Average renovations will run about $50,000. Uh, the property will be sold uh, at a markup, uh, leading to a sale price on average of $260,000 with about $25,000 per property uh, as a profit. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, they're doing in this model, and the big concern is when they resell this property, is anybody going to be able to afford uh, the acquisition of the property. Um, one of the things that's being done is in the sale of the property, ordinarily uh, the full broker fee will run about 7% of the transaction. Uh, this is going to be sold directly by the company, so the 3% that would go to the selling broker is going to be used as a cash down payment uh, for the buyer if the buyer has invested into this um, particular project. So if they invest part of the money here into the $600,000, one, they're going to get a preference on buying the house over anybody who's not an investor into this particular fund, and they will qualify for 3% of the purchase price to be paid at closing as a cash contribution to the down payment. And uh, there's a number of programs out there for low-income communities where that amount plus other programs that are out there are expected to make this an affordable acquisition. Yes? So are you saying that the buyer, the ultimate buyer of the property, that's a community member that wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to buy, has to invest in the 600000 Yes, they do. And so that 600000 that crowdfunding investment, where does that money, what kind of money does that qualify? Like, so if I was a person in the community that 
wanted to buy. I'm investing in this fund? You would be investing in this fund. The minimum investment is $100. So, uh, and it, can be, it doesn't have to be the gains like the other rule. No, this, doesn't, it, this is not a capital gain rollover. This is just a, a classical standard equity investment into this particular company that's then coupled with these types of rewards. So if you invest in, you get preference on selling the house, uh, you get the down payment assistance, and if you are, are a contractor engaged to work in the uh, re retrofit or refix of the house, you go to the front of the line to actually acquire the house, which mm -hmm. has kind of a Habitat for Humanity Whatever. style twisted. Right. And so the only place where the capital gains goes into is the fund itself? Yeah, the That's correct. Orange. For opportunity zone purposes, this is the only money that is a, a pure, uh, well, it's an opportunity zone style investment. And its money is coming then into the property management company, which is using it to seed each of the, uh, the rejuvenation businesses and to help carry operations until it gets to profitable status. Okay, this is, we're good here. Yes, Rick. Could you go back to the next the, uh, the slide where you had the break? Yes. Let us assume that uh, mortgage uh, rate, uh, payments are running $400 per every $100,000 value of the mortgage. So what you're looking at roughly is about a thousand dollar mortgage payment. The, the question I would raise, and I'm sure we'll address it as well, is in these areas that are, that are uh, economically deprived, could the people afford, I mean they're paying rent anyway, could they afford a thousand dollars a month? That's a, it's an excellent question because it will vary with the community, with the house, uh, the person who's living in the house. Right now, it's common in affordable housing where uh, they're paying rent only with no wealth building potential for half of their income to go towards the rental payment. Uh, so uh, you're going to see a disproportionate allocation of personal income towards rentals uh, in affordable housing, and, and this is supposed to be an alternative to that. Now, I will tell you that some of the properties that are being acquired have been as low as $60,000, which will obviously, you know, drop this down, uh, and it's going to vary from community to community. And right now, there are certain places in Denver you couldn't begin to do this kind of a program because it's simply not possible. Uh, and uh, so it, it's it's going to depend as you go through that, but that's. That's one of the elements that we're going to be looking at continuously as we roll this out in scale is are we able to put this back into the community at an affordable price? Uh, one second before I get to your question. Now, right now, this is a straight, pure acquisition model, meaning that this is being sold in with some assistance in the down payment, but no other type of participation. So we're also looking at equity share models where we may create an opportunity zone fund that comes in above uh, the, um, the orange box up there that will participate in both the down payment and or the co-payments through the price of this and have a split equity in the property which will serve to push the, the level down even further in order to allow people to come into the property. Um, we're also working with a model and I have a, a short concept paper on it with me here where we could even do a pure rental model uh, where the each payment on the rent includes a set aside uh, to buy an equity interest in the building so that you can build wealth over time uh, within that particular uh, structure. So we see a variety of different equity share and cost reduction models can be used. Another one that is being talked about today would be for an employer to come in and buy this particular house and then uh, through their employment make this house available with a wealth building mechanism built into it uh, for their employees if they stay with the company for a period of time. Uh, so uh, they may end up being the buyer which allows a cash exit for this particular property for this uh, company uh, and then at the same time it's assured that it's going to someone in the community and it's affordable, attainable, whatever term you're using to get into the property at that point. Yes? So when the property is sold, the people that invest in the opportunity fund that, op that ultimately op are uh, invested in the property, how does the sale of that property and those profits, where does that go to and how is the person who's investing in the opportunity fund 
holding on to it for 10 years if you're then selling the property? Yeah, so um, we'll get into that more a little bit later in the distribution, but it, it's one of the issues that's still on the table today on how best to structure the legal entity for the opportunity fund in order to minimize ordinary taxable income during the 10-year time period. And, and so each project is different. So as each property is sold here, it rolls the profits come up into the property management company, which is owned uh, to a significant degree by the investors in the fund. What percentage of the opportunity fund is owned in the property of the property management company is owned. Like you know, how much of the property management company does the opportunity fund own? Right now, we haven't locked in those numbers yet, but they've been floating between as, th as low as 30% of the property management as high as 60%. If we go over 50%, we're probably going to be working with a non-voting type of ownership position, but because of the opportunity zone laws, it has to be an equity investment. It can't be a rev share or, or a loan. It's got to be equity, but it doesn't have to be voting equity. And what we're trying to achieve at the property management level is a, uh, a minimum average annual re rate of return of 10%, uh, which would be passed through uh, um, tax-free uh, once that interest is liquidated. Oh, I think you answered my question when you uh, just talked about the property management getting the profits, but on that previous slide, the 24,000 change, is that where that money is going? Yeah, this would be the profit that would be earned by the blue one of the blue boxes. Yeah. So it's held there. There are investors in it, so they get a portion of that profit, and that's not an opportunity zone style investment. So it's treated so as as ordinary income business. passing through to uh, the investors at this level. Part of the profits will rise up to the property management company as their share of. Uh, participating in each of these projects and part of that is then owned by the investors in the Opportunity Zone Fund. So you're doing a balancing act between three levels of entities and what the share of ownership is in order to achieve a desired outcome in terms of return on investment. And, and that's an open question right now as to how much ROI is necessary to attract investors into this. Uh, and uh, what the, the net net outcome is when you look at the opportunity zone impact on this. So each one of those tiers has some skin in the game then, basically. That's correct. You're, you're talking about a 10% uh, return on investment. Um, and, uh, is it a stretch of the imagination to say is a 10% return on investment again in 10 years? Do they have a 100% return on investment, or is that? No, there's a 10% per year, so yes. Technically, over a 10-year time, you're going to double your money, and uh, the uh, net between your original investment and uh, the delta on that, which is 100% of your original investment, would be tax-free uh, of, of your gain. So, at, so say you put in uh, $10,000, and at the end of 10 years, you now have $20,000. 10,000 is your basis, so that's not taxable, but your gain on that, which is another 10,000, ordinarily would be taxable as a long-term capital gain. In this case, it would be tax-free. Isn't it also conceivable that it's compounded? The Compounding doesn't actually apply here okay. uh, because you're, you're calculating the net-net at the end of the 10-year term, and then you're, you're basically determining the, the totality of 10 years of capital gains divided over a 10-year time period to get an average annual ROI. Um, the compounding might work uh, in terms of the number of projects you could potentially take on. If you're building a cash reserve over time from each of these transactions, you theoretically can expand the number of projects you're doing, which would accelerate the amount of money you could potentially make, which would improve the net yield on the project. We haven't done it in this modeling because it gets too complex to explain. Uh, yes, Mike. Uh, Carl, can you clarify a statement you made earlier about the fact that it was all the rules only allowed an equity investment versus and did not allow royalty funding or royalty shares? How is that in this particular model? You're saying it's restricted at the opportunity fund level, or it's restricted down at the at the 
uh, so the question is, is uh, for an opportunity zone investment, it must be an ownership investment, either directly into property or into an ownership right in the company or business receiving the money. So what's happening here is the property management company is generating profits. It will uh, distribute part of that money upwards into the fund if it's held as an LLC, as a pass-through entity, then actually there will be ordinary income accruing to each of the investors in the fund. If it's set up as a corporation, then uh, you will not have the pass-through, but the, the corporation who's receiving that income from the property management will be taxed at corporate rates. And so uh, you do have to take into consideration which path you want and which taxable rate is appropriate um, the reason I asked that was that this model presupposes that you're going to be doing a fix and flip, buy and sell, and an owner, someone's going to take on that mortgage and take on that property. So it's not a rental model it's on not. the surface. So if you had a solution like this at the property management or project level that was rental focused, so you had rental income, like the way REITs operate, real estate investment right. trusts get in a large apartment complex and they put them in their portfolios and their investors share in the pro rata. Profits. Is it possible to do the same model in the Opportunity Zone Fund strategy by setting up an entity that would manage rents and provide pro rata shares of income back to it? Yes, uh, it's just a different program. Instead of basically taking a house like a product, marking it up and getting profit every time you flip one, and they're looking at flipping houses every three months, you've got monthly rents, which is also ordinary income, all coming back to the same point. So the, there is, you know, it's a different type of transaction and one's quarterly as opposed to monthly, but it's all ordinary income coming up through the process to that point. And so only the, that net net after taxes, which is accruing within the, uh, the management company, is the uh, participation by the Opportunity Zone investors, which over 10 years will, is assumed to be of a higher amount. If you don't sell the house or if you had a crash in the real estate industry and suddenly no one's buying houses, this model is going to be highly challenged. And they might need to go to a rental model or another alternative structure in order to do that. And you've worked out exit strategies for the property re re rejuvenation businesses to come in and out of this model. Right? Well, in this case, the yeah, the, what we're setting up here, these are five-year funds. So you put your money in for five years. We're actually, this is a monthly annuity payback. So we're doing both uh, return of capital and a share of distributions over the, uh, over the five-year time period. So you could do royalty financing and funding down at that level? You can at this level because it's not restricted. Right. Yeah. And the idea is that this is, you're in and out for five years. You get 60 payments over the five-year term, and you're done. Everything's liquidated, and the funds have to be renewed in order to get another five years to match up with the 10-year cycle for the property okay. management company. Is yes. anyone can get into that, or you have to go to the uh, Into which? I'm sorry. Into, the, into investing into the property. Yeah, right now, these are going to be uh, run as um, regulation CF, federal level investment crowdfunding campaign. So they'll be posted up nationally. Uh, and uh, anyone can invest at that point. There is no preference on investing to the local community, uh, and uh, anyone who wants to invest can do that. And there's some reasons for that that I'll get to in a moment on why there may or may not be the right number or quantity of investors uh, to come into this level of investment versus this level of investment, because they're going to have slightly different motivations on, on becoming an investor. Yes, Rick. You, you uh, actually answered a question, but it's kind of intriguing. In this model, the assumption is that you're going to turn that property in. You're going to, you're going to have that property, which is conceivable, uh, remodeled legit once you get the thing going. Yeah, as long as you don't hire the contractors and redid our house, <laughs> yes. it came to your project. <laughs> well, we watched, uh, I've watched the, the straight list. list right? I've watched uh, the property builders and so forth. It's, it's, it's TV. Yeah, TV. It is TV. So but the other question I have, uh, or you brought up, which is kind of interesting, is that you're looking at a five-year time frame rather than a ten-year time frame. Um, and, and here's the reason why on that, Rick, and then the question is why is this five-year and why is this ten-year? Um, it's very difficult today to get any investor to put money in for a long period of time. 
This is a classical investment structure of three to five years. We're paying it back like an annuity, so there is a monthly uh, cash flow coming back out of the investment. But if you came to somebody and said, I want to do 10, you're going to lose a good portion of the crowd. One of the challenges for opportunity zones is getting anyone to make a 10-year investment because it's a long period of time and things change over that period of time. So uh, we're studying the cash flow uh, models to see if there is access to cash or other issues that would allow people to put money into a fund without feeling that they're trapped within the fund and no access to cash during that 10-year time, year time frame. But 10 years is a long time, and that's why there's, these are basically two types of investors with two different agendas and two different payout structures in order to create more flexibility and to better fit what we think is going to be the investment style of the local community versus the opportunities in the community. There's less tax There's less tax advantages, yes. So um, anyway, uh, the, uh, at this point, we are now working out all the details. We're doing spreadsheets on three different levels with the interconnect between the, the, the fund, the property management company, and each of the rejuvenation businesses. Uh, we are working on the actual structure of the deal to each of the investors so we know how much equity and what kind of rewards we can offer. Uh, and then as we work through all the securities requirements on how we can present it, we can be investors, where we're going to do the campaigns, uh, we'll deal with federal and uh, state securities laws, and then we'll also always have the uh, state, real estate requirements to conform to. Business plans will be developed for each tier. Uh, we'll use a renewable template for each of the rejuvenation businesses and then this will all be formalized in a series of interlocking contracts so it's all, it's all tied down and we can show this to the investors at any level so they know uh, what's done, the conflicts which are inherent in this interrelationship of all these businesses which will be basically under the control of a single management team. So the, man, uh, the, um, the fund initially would be owned by the management company and then diluted down probably by 99% uh, in terms of who owns the fund. The fund is owning stock with the money it's investing into the property management company and that particular uh, threshold has not been locked. And then in turn it will invest into uh, these individuals and match that money with local money so there will be uh, two types of investors in the um, property rejuvenation businesses. So uh, it seems a little complex at this point, but I still consider this far simpler than doing a massive industrial complex like we talked about with the Sugar Beet District uh, last time we got together. So uh, this is part of the analysis that we are going through now to determine who is likely to invest and what we may need to tweak in the deal structure in order to attract investors into the project. So we essentially uh, start off with what I call stakeholder analysis. We look to see who will succeed, who will benefit from the success of this particular project. So we start over here with residents of the community uh, where they're, they're looking to get better quality living without gentrification uh, at an affordable level. Uh, we're also going to have all the merchants in the area because this is going to have a positive economic impact on uh, the businesses who sell products and services to the residents within the community. Uh, we will be looking at local organizations, um, which in this case, um, uh, this is part of their mission. There's a lot of groups that work with housing for low income people, and so we're helping them fulfill their mission. The reason why this is important is we may find uh, funding of a faith-based organization, a church, might actually invest into the local community fund or even into the national fund, um, even though they can't get the capital gains that benefit that everybody else does. Uh, at the local level, this is why it would be easier to sell them that the, the particular church down the street uh, takes part of its money and puts it into this in order to upgrade the houses in the community. We uh, talk about communities of color. Uh, there are all kinds of groups and associations and charities and organizations which are working in this area. Uh, we are helping them fulfill their mission. Uh, the property owners who are selling are actually creating a marketplace where before they may not have been able to get out of their property or at a price point that would be good for them. 
in turn the property buyers. Uh, there will be real estate brokers involved on the um, purchase side of this transaction, so it will be commissions on, on that side. Um, this may be one of our largest candidates to invest because we're talking about 50000 on average to upgrade a house, and that includes plumbers, roofers, electricians, HVAC people. We're going, uh, now we're pumping money into our local economy, and we're going to try to use uh, those who are in the local community as a, a preference on contractors. Uh, obviously, from an economic development standpoint, when you upgrade the housing in the community, there is a positive impact on the community, the city, and the state, uh, which may translate into more taxes uh, on property and other purposes as well as even potential greater wages, uh, the people who reside within the community. So there's different ways that they get a benefit from this. And you can't recruit a business into the community where there's no housing, which is what we're hearing from most of the economic development people, that uh, I could put in Amazon here next week, and they said they need, what, 50,000 houses or something. There's no, uh, there's no inventory of houses in the community. Uh, the media uh, probably is going to do well with this. Uh, we're going to play this out and try to get as much publicity for this. Um, that may make us uh, feel better about it, but they, I don't expect them to be an investor um, in that sense. Uh, as we move into social causes, this is where uh, we may start looking to community foundations or uh, particular themed uh, charities, uh, and particularly at the foundation level, to make program-related investments. Again, where we're in alignment with the mission of that particular charity or foundation, this would actually be a good investment for them to make uh, compared with other things. And again, more at the local level where they're not as much interested in the uh, capital gains uh, incentives as it would be otherwise. And then we get to investors where they're looking at, is, is this a good investment? Is it a reasonably safe investment over a 10-year term? Uh, is the rate of return high enough? Uh, and it's not that it's high enough necessarily from one perspective, but how will this compete with every other opportunity zone investment in the United States, which could be in the hundred thousand, uh, hundreds of thousands of different offerings. So as we are looking at who might invest in these uh, particular projects, uh, we see that at this level, this is a hyper-local community where everybody knows your name, kind of an investor. And then as we move to the Opportunity Zone Fund, we're looking at people who uh, may be social cause uh, um, for whatever reason. Uh, they want to invest, and they have capital gains to roll over, so they are going to be more of an impact uh, type of investor. Uh, and uh, because of the ROI that we're offering, we may never see more of an angel or institutional investor of one type, but we might see investors who are long-term patient capital investors. So we might see insurance companies and other groups who, who tend to make the longer-term truly patient capital investments participate up here in order to maximize their gains. Uh, while these are, as I say, uh, this is everybody who knows your name type of an investor. So uh, as we, we get to the business plans right now, this is uh, going on constantly, is don't get stuck in yesterday's formulas. Let's look at different ways to structure ownership, different ways to uh, make this affordable without it being a subsidy. Everything still has to be sustainable uh, because we're not looking for anybody to, to pick this up and carry it. Uh, there may be other programs out there that you can match that might be viewed as a a form of subsidy or charity uh, where if uh, part of the down payment is made uh, by the local company, it may turn out that the church might also contribute something in or some other group might contribute something in. And we want to look at all these different configurations and interactions and we will continue to refine the business plan and then run test scenarios against it constantly uh, because uh, anytime you do something new or different, there's places where it may not work or it may break despite the logic that's behind it. Um, and so uh, we'll continue working on the uh, planning. Um, and then as I said, the initial private equity investment into the property management company uh, will be used to acquire one property in each of the five communities. And there are two uh, acquisitions in motion. Uh, this is an example is a $110,000 house in the third ward of Houston. 
uh, that's on the market right now, uh, which is not one of the ones they're purchasing, but it's simply used as an illustration that uh, there are houses there that uh, fixed up and resold uh, would uh, contribute to the general quality of life within the neighborhood and uh, done correctly will allow it to the people in the community to remain in place and not get pushed out into a, a, another community by gentrification. So uh, after all this work and after all this preparation, we're ready to raise money into the Opportunity Zone Fund. And uh, saw a lot of uh, comments uh, at various programs on Opportunity Zone investment and even at the conference that uh, concern me because they give the impression there's going to be funds standing ready to write checks into each of these projects and that you won't have to go through the process of raising capital into a fund for your own project. And I, I don't think that's going to be the case and particularly in community projects where they have a social impact goal and they're going to use the ROI as a secondary benefit to the investor, we're looking at lower margins, lower rates of return and they will be less attractive to people who are focused on higher rates of return. So in those cases, I anticipate that it will be necessary to go out and bang the drum and let people know uh, about this particular project. So you're going to publicize the investment opportunity. Uh, it will be run uh, as a um, Reg CF, national federal level crowdfunding campaign. Uh, you will reach out and contact uh, all the people we identified on this map uh, to let them know this is going to happen and even though only a few of these may invest, the, the gross numbers may lead to enough people to get to the minimum where we're trying to raise $600,000 uh, into the Opportunity Zone Fund and uh, we'll do the usual information distribution which is uh, media, live events, social media, um, and then the platform itself will uh, have its own ability to, to talk. Uh, what I've found in raising money at this level is that uh, you don't need a lot of contact or relationship to get an investment, but there's got to be trust at that minimal level. People simply will not invest because you showed up and said oh, you're looking for money. If they don't have some reasonable relationship with you, they don't have some sense that you are a solid player and you're doing something that aligns with their personal cause or mission, you probably will not get the kind of investment you're looking for. And then as investors come on board into the campaign, you're going to start creating a viral cascade where you're going to ask each investor to go out and become one of your uh, recruiters to bring more investments into the campaign uh, with the goal of, of raising all of your money within approximately 90 days after the campaign starts. Statutorily, you have a year to run a campaign, but if you're, you're not well funded into your minimum goal within the first 30 to 60 days, statistically there's very uh, few who will cross the finish line uh, at that point. That's um, the crowdfunding number you're talking about? Yeah. yeah. Now, so, so at that level, they're not, they're not talking about opportunities and over funding benefits, right? At that level? That's well, not part of the discussion there. These, right? um, the, um, Sorry. So, this is these will all be investment crowdfunding, but this will also right. be investment crowdfunding. The only difference really between these two is we're looking to probably a different profile in the investor, and the only people who can participate here are those who have capital gain rollovers. So they're like a subset of all the potential investors that you might talk to here. Um, but they may not live in the backyard uh, where we're going to be emphasizing your, your presentation. Is it possible they have a tier of opportunity zone funds where you have a macro at the top in the model you just described? Instead of the rejuvenation companies, could you put the initial money into these property management firms but create a sub opportunity zone for acquiring asset property that throws off revenues? And um, that would be an asset investment, so you basically have down at the bottom layer. Yeah, so, so one of the things we could do 
is this could, instead of being a uh, standard investment crowdfunding campaign, this could be one type of opportunity zone investment. Right. Right. This could be a different one. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I like about the way this is set up is we could even do something that is limited to buying the property. We could have a separate one that is uh, uh, its own rejuvenation business or, or uh, repair business. We might find that we're using half a dozen common contractors and we're stressing them out with the work we're throwing at them. And we do uh, opportunity zone fund for each of them. And that's why this segmenting makes a lot of sense because you can really spread your risk out. Well, and, and that's what you want. You want to look for that modularity in your design. If you start getting monolithic where everything's under one roof, uh, your ability to adapt and, and adjust goes way down. So that's why there's so many different funds and set up. And even here, we may split these. Uh, or as I said, you might create another fund up here that is participating in each of these properties as needed uh, as kind of a you know, fallback mechanism. There has been talk about, uh, even though in terms of the rulemaking, 90% of the funds that come into the Opportunity Zone Fund have to go into the Opportunity Zone itself. What about that 10%? Is that for like administrative management, carry? What's up there at the 10% level? The, uh, the question has to do with the, the way the rules read is that of the 600000 that comes into the fund, 90% is supposed to be spent within, within the, the, the zone. zone. In the which is still, still a loose, loose definition. definition. No, in a year. That's to be done in a year. Well, right. it's, it's still, still a loose definition right. from the standpoint that uh, I might buy a sink that's made in Georgia that's put into a house in Houston. Mm -hmm. Well, because it's embedded in the house in Houston, it's within my zone. So it, in that sense, it's loose. You do have 10% or 60,000 of this can be spent outside of the zone anywhere. anywhere. Now, it might go to internal uh, admin, but they don't care once you invest into a business. If you're doing a direct property, then you're asking, what are you doing with that 10%? But it could be the adjoining block, or you buy a park, or you upgrade the local park. That's not in the opportunity zone to complement what you're doing. You've got a lot of a lot of options there, and then you're correct. Once the initial investment is made, uh, there's um, that business is can take the profits that are percolating up, and those who do not have to be invested in the zone. So you start getting more and more flexibility as you generate more and more profits, which are not part of that original uh, mix. Uh, going the wrong way. Okay. So, just have one more. Yeah. yeah. So you talk about the 90% and all that. So once you take the 600,000 from the, the top and you put it into the management company, and that management company, the, does that have to be located in the zone, right? Yeah. yeah. Any, any business or property receiving an investment from a fund must be in the zone. And then substantially, all that money is supposed to be spent within the zone. And it starts getting fuzzier and fuzzier as the more further down the chain you go. Now, you started a, a company in that zone, and that company is property management. OK, so uh, once that takes place, and you say you're renting someplace, and they're just not an address in there, then you can basically just start, you know, as you said, flipping houses or buying property, renting property, just providing property management services to other existing buildings that are already there. I mean, you can expand to whatever you want to do yeah. in that zone as a company. That's, That's correct. correct. Okay. So, so the question is, yeah. yeah, what can you do with the money that comes into that company? Now, this model, we're doing fix and flips. But it could be any type of business. It could be a plumbing business that's doing repairs on the, on the houses in the area. It could be a rental arrangement. Uh, as long as the money is being substantially expended within the zone, which meets the purpose of this whole exercise, it's taking money from here and sticking it in a place where it wouldn't go otherwise by giving these tax incentives. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, uh, profits come up. And then so say there's 30% are going to go to the to the fund. So there's 30%, you, you made a million dollars the first year, $300,000 goes into that fund. Okay, does that money then, it goes back to the individual people that year in the, that own that fund, 
or does that have to, um, you know, sit there for ten years before you can start accessing that that money? You, uh, the question is, what happens to profits that are earned during the ten-year time period? And it depends upon how you structure the fund. So if I structure the fund as a corporation, uh, then that money is coming in there and it's going to sit there uh, less taxes on ordinary income earned by the corporation over the 10-year term. If I decide that I want to use an LLC or an LLP type of a structure, then uh, there is going to be a pass-through of earnings to the people in the, the fund, but you may structure that so you only distribute a portion of those earnings, enough to allow them to pay the taxes on the ordinary income, and then you hold the, the residual of that to try to increase the value of the organization over time, or you can distribute all of it. So then those people are paying, whoever's in that fund is paying ordinary income on that fund. And one of the real values of this that I saw was when you get to any uh, capital gains that you're making on that investment, investment is tax-free after 10 years. Right. So, the right. so where do you see the capital gains coming from in this market? So what would happen is at the end of the 10-year term, you have stock in a corporation that's been giving you dividends or something. Say, say you went to Wall Street today and you bought stock in a corporation. I understand okay. that. Yep. Yeah, so similar here. If they're paying out dividends, you're getting taxed on that throughout this entire time. You're going, you know, it would be better for me if they left them in the company and the value of the company went up so I got a higher capital gains. So when you're doing as an investor, you'll look at each of these individual opportunities uh, funds and say this matches what I wanted my company to do uh, because if, if I were going to maximize maximize the tax benefit I would invest directly from the fund into a property where I would not liquidate the property till after the 10-year term because then there'd be no ordinary income on that property during that time frame but if the if the money's uh, going that route a lot of these organizations are not going to have that option they're basically going to be engaged in some kind of business that's generating ordinary income, and you want to have them structure this to minimize the ordinary income so that there is a greater buildup of value. So at the end of 10 years, they have stock in this fund. What we would expect is that there will be another capital campaign by the property management company, and they will buy out at market value their holdings. It's like buying out your shareholders at that point, which becomes a cash event, and that's a distribution of capital gains at that time. Right, so you're, you, you are hoping, because if you're a minority shareholder, or you have no voting rights, all you have is hope. Either way. And then, right, so that, that that management company now has value in and of itself, okay, and that somebody's going to want to buy that, and then that's where your capital gains is. Yeah, that you're not going to get taxed. Either that or they're going to liquidate all their assets and move to 100% cash and do a 100% distribution, which would still serve as, as a basically a capital gain event at that point in time. Yeah, either one. Yeah. But you, in being a minority shareholder, you don't have, is there going to be a, at the end of 10 years, something has to happen clause in this? Yeah, you would expect in the operating documents, the investment agreement, that there's a mandatory distribution at some fixed point in the future so you know how long your investment is going to be. And what we would expect is in that agreement, uh, there might be the option for you to stay in or get out at the end of 10 years because you may want to say they're doing just fine profits are compiling you know inside of this company so I don't want to come out at the end of 10 years you can now go out to 2047 uh, as a final date for one of these entities and so you would might have a contract that says yes at the end of 10 years I have a right to be liquidated out of this and you know recognize my capital gains and go home uh, or I may have an option to extend uh, or something along that line so um, as we're saying here, each of the, the, the local companies is going to do their own crowdfunding campaign. These are going to be cookie cuttered, but then tailored back to the individual community. 
So even though we know we're looking to a particular class of people who are the most likely to invest in this, they're all going to be in different communities and you're going to have to go out and build those relationships and, and run these, these particular campaigns. Now, by this time, when you're running this campaign, you've already acquired a house with money that came out of the Opportunity Zone Fund. You have a showcase for how this works. You may have already closed on your, uh, um, basically, fix and flip and have profits sitting in the company as a demonstration of how this would work, which will make it easier to communicate and convey that we intend to do this uh, so many more times over a five-year time period. And, and again, in this model, uh, what we're going to do is a uh, basically a, a, a mortgage style pay down or a five year monthly payout uh, to get to a particular ROI by the end of the project. If there's more money in the company at the end of the time because it made more profits, there'll just be a, a lump sum payment uh, on the 60th month to cap everybody out. If a mortgage company buys this property, I mean, a person does it through a mortgage company, is there a restriction? on the terms of the mortgage, like 15 years, 30 years, or anything like that, or five years, suicide? Uh, yeah, so the question is, is whoever buys a, uh, a fix and flip property, is there going to be a restriction on ownership? And uh, there doesn't have to be, is, is the answer, because they're buying it under this model as free and clear title. Now, if we decided that we wanted to put a restrictive covenant in there within the range of what's permissible by law, uh, there may be other things in there that would make it difficult for someone from out of town to come in and buy up a whole bunch of properties and hold them in effect as a, as a landlord uh, in the property. We may, we may want to do something that inhibits or restricts that, again, for the general purpose of what's taking place here. But uh, right now, there's no intent to put any of these kinds of restrictions in, in this particular model. And earlier that there were community organizations that could be aligned in this model. There's a lot of the community development finance institutions as well as housing authorities in many local markets obviously are markets for these houses they can fix and flip so they can make it part of their low income housing stock. As many, many of these housing authorities in local communities buy up properties and then they write them out at 30% AMI or 50% AMI rents and they're somewhat protected but they never have enough inventory. So do you think that that's another possibility where they could be a source of the sale of these properties? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, could some of these community organizations be potential buyers? And the answer is obviously yes. And in fact, Habitat for Humanity is now rolling out a program of this nature. Uh, there was uh, a program uh, over at the Alliance Center a few months ago where there's a number of private groups and, and charitable groups who are trying to figure out how to address this problem by coming in and doing different models where they, they're uh, buying and marking up a fixed amount and then they expect the buyer to make so many improvements over the first 12 months to bring it up to, the, to what the market value would be. So there, there's all kinds of ways of experimenting in this area where uh, a local group who's dealing with the housing issue can become involved at, at some level. So social impact investor who want to have an impact on housing to create their own opportunity fund and then make investments through the housing authorities as far as asset purchases are concerned. And so it's all the same buying the inventory that's being produced on the fix and flip side. Yeah, so the question is whether an individual could set up their own opportunity zone fund and then work through uh, a local housing authority. And, and to the extent there's no prohibition upon that style of investment or money coming in, yes, they could do it that way or they could work with a local church or some other uh, community organization to be the intermediary who could help vet the buyers or support the buyers or something of that nature. So uh, at this point, uh, as I said, Brown Equity Partners will be the name of the property management company. The Opportunity Fund will put the money into there. They will start the ball rolling by picking up a number of properties and then setting up each of the property rejuvenation businesses. So it's a three-tier uh, stacked cake here. Uh, we're using four to five different types of money in a capital stack, including borrowing uh, off-the-market mortgage money uh, that's currently available. Uh, we'll probably be looking at a variety of programs that are intended for low income to either support the down payment or, or help in some manner. 
Uh, but right now, we're again, this is a simplified model compared to more complex varieties that we can get into. If the market changes or mortgage funding uh, requirements shift or something like that, we may see uh, a different type of model being implemented, whether it's a rent with wealth building or a different type of equity share or some other mechanism to continue to move properties through the cycle as often as possible within these uh, communities. So uh, they're looking at uh, each of these property rejuvenation businesses doing about two houses uh, every quarter or uh, a total of eight per year. And in the third ward alone, there's 987 residences. So this will have an impact, but it's not going to completely take care of the problem. The, the question is, is uh, within the rules for opportunity zones, if you use money from a fund to acquire a property, a direct purchase of a property, then you are required to make an improvement of that property equal to the purchase price of the property. In this case, the money's going into a property management services company. It's not going into the purchase of properties, and that's being done with the money coming in from the community level. So we're really not subject to the restrictions that would be occurring if we went directly from a fund directly to a property. The question is, is it, we're asking the question, is there a marketplace for the, uh, the improved houses, the upgraded houses? Mm -hmm. Because it, the logic would suggest that if the house was livable at the lower price, uh, uh, or nobody could afford to buy it at the lower price, why would they be able to afford it at the higher price? And, and it's assumed right now livable is a very, very broad definition. So I, I'm uh, concerned about going too far down that path. But yeah, the, without some kind of assistance in uh, helping acquire this house coming both from the property management, uh, rejuvenation business, and maybe other community programs, uh, again, I don't see this, this is going to, to work that well because, uh, yeah, low-income people are, are going to be challenged to come up with any kind of a down payment. And, and I understand the down payment assistance could help with that matter, but there's other programs out there that have that down assistance program. And, like, for example, my neighborhood, the properties that are quote-unquote affordable still at, like, 250000 are in pretty bad shape. And so people are buying them because they don't have the money to fix them up. And so that's where like these fix and flippers are coming into my neighborhood and doing that. Um, that was just my question is, are these houses like in Birmingham or possibly Detroit or something like that totally white? That would make sense. Yeah, no, my understanding is that these are uh, basically houses that are being lived in. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them are rentals and uh, the property owner is looking to part with them for any number of reasons. And uh, Yes, uh, the, the, the assistance here is probably going to have to be combined with one or more other programs to enable someone to come into the house. And it actually may not be one of those things where they couldn't afford to get into the house as is with a standard down payment requirement. But w even with an upgraded uh, and an enhanced price, it will now become possible because of this combination of things that are going into the down payment. You still can't get so high in the monthly payments that they can't afford to live in the house, uh, but it may overcome the down payment issue. The amount of money. No, that's what we were talking about a moment before, okay. is that the money going into this is coming out of the local community fund, which is not an Oz fund. Okay? Those are the, the uh, so, funding funds. So we're doing the rejuvenation at this level, and this is not Oz money. This is not Opportunity Zone money. This is regular money. Oh. So we don't have to do the doubling down on the property acquisition. So the money's coming into a management services company, so it's a services company. It's providing services to all these businesses. It's not technically buying the property, it's seeding them with an original property as an investment. Uh, but after that, the money's coming in here, so it's not subject to the same requirement. Well, let's just stay with that example. Um, it's still a, uh, that money at some point has to be doubled or something. Or no, no. The, the rule is if the money comes in here okay. and you buy property from the fund, then you have to make an enhancement to the property equal to the purchase price mm -hmm. of the property. But the money's not coming into the property from here, it's coming into the properties from down here. With for, for the joke is that if you're doing direct investments out of an opportunity zone, don't go buy a commercial building that's brand new and fully occupied 
because there's no way you're going to put enough more money into it to meet the rule. Now, if you're buying a $100,000 property and there may be $100,000 of upgrades to it in order to bring it to market, then that's what you would have to do. But again, that would still be difficult, which is why you're using two types of money in this model. At the end of the day, uh, uh, depending upon which model in this case, we're going to collapse everything at the end of 10 years. Uh, the idea is that we'll shut everything down. We'll basically distribute funds, uh, cash funds, to all the investors who have invested into the company through the fund, and they will be able to declare that as an exit uh, for purposes of recognizing a capital gain. All that's got to be calculated out. All the documents have to be filed so that when you report that to the IRS, uh, that becomes tax-free money if you've held it for the full 10 years and um, it all will show up appropriately uh, when the fund does its reporting. So uh, in a pass-through entity like we're talking about here, you're probably going to contract out 100% of the services and do minimal everything just to make sure the reports are in place and it, it'll be a, a, a bare bones type of an existence for a legal entity. And it's really going to be involved at the front end when the monies are raised and at the end of the 10 years when the final reports are issued. Between those two points in this case, there isn't going to be too much activity taking place. So uh, at the end of the day, you've got to run. Thank you for coming. Um, money is distributed out and everything's shut down. Uh, done correctly, you get 100% tax-free gain on your investment in the uh, fund. Uh, which in this case invested in the uh, Brown Equity Partners property management company. Um, one of the things that will be going on concurrently is already we are getting inquiries from people before we're up and running yet about how they can do what we're doing or going to do in the very near future. So uh, we are looking at the possibility of creating uh, a package or teaming or joint venturing in communities beyond the five that are currently within the business plan and, uh, and bringing a, a full tilt set of documents and pricing and numbers and fundraising uh, all together to do that. And um, this is in discussion at the moment uh, while we're still finishing off the planning for the rest of this venture. So um, case studies wise, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we're going to take a number of different projects which fall in one or more of these community uh, challenge categories and our goal is to create uh, uh, a case study as a do-it-yourself commit uh, kit. Uh, this will be a relatively low-level type of thing. It, it basically, it will be truly do-it-yourself. Um, and uh, But uh, we're expecting a lot of communities I've talked to uh, looking at both new construction and other types of things to, to get into this uh, and start uh, considering how Opportunity Zone money uh, can be put to work uh, to uh, help particularly with the heavy lifting money which is the front end down payment money uh, and maybe some of the construction contract. Um, on issues, uh, we're going to continue to collect issues and questions and post them up on the website uh, and this one is one of the questions that uh, is coming up is how soon do you need to deploy money in an Opportunity Zone fund? Uh, the, it, it varies. So uh, if you're buying property, they want you to do it immediately. If you're putting it into a business and that business is doing property development, somehow it's now 30 months or six, three years, and even that is a little bit fuzzy. But they don't want you sitting on the money. They want the money to be active. They want you to be pursuing uh, your project uh, aggressively to move it through uh, because, again, the intent of all this is to put money to work in communities where you can start getting the economic reverb uh, from that particular investment. So um, these are the sources of information. Uh, this is the meetup group you're at right now. Uh, our next meeting is a week from today. We're going to talk about community collaboration. Uh, there is a program uh, with the state right now where DOLA will put up $25,000 uh, as matching money to help a community uh, do a portfolio or prospectus for all the opportunities within their community. Uh, we're going to talk about that uh, and uh, other ways to get people to come together and get more organized in a hurry. 
Part of our concern uh, when we started this all the way back uh, earlier this year was that we would see a, an economic downturn or we would see a massive correction in Wall Street and Wall Street closing at 540 points today is not good, but if it goes down 15,000 points, that's another story. And, and the concern is that people will sell off in the downturn and they'll have 180 days in which to put their money to work through an opportunity zone uh, fund, but if the fund doesn't exist and it's not ready, then there's really nothing they can do. So that is the end of the program for this evening. I'm sorry for your question. We're running out of tape and time, uh, so I will answer your question here uh, right now. So that's it.